coming back, we're going to start up with our next panel, which is on uh, why self-custody and privacy are important. Uh, I'm going to let the panelists and then our moderator, Tomas, introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our panel here. I'm Tomas. I will uh, excuse my English in advance, uh, but yeah. Uh, I've been uh, tracking this space since 2016 as a enthusiast, self-learner, and also an uh, educator. And uh, I, uh, I'm an MIT Sloan uh, alum, and, uh, and also a member of the MIT Bitcoin Club and the uh, Expo Committee for five years now. Uh, yeah, so uh, perhaps uh, the first thing is uh, to have a, a round of introductions uh, from uh, of our panelists. Yeah, go first. Hi, I'm Jesse Myers. Um, go by Creasis on Twitter. Uh, you might have saw my having talk earlier today. I'm with uh, OnRamp Bitcoin. We are the uh, leading provider of multi-institution, multi-sig custody for Bitcoin. Um, so I know more about the, the custody side than the, the privacy side of things, but yeah, that's me. I'm uh, Jameson Lopp, co-founder and chief security officer at CASA, where uh, we provide self-custody solutions as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacey Waleko. I'm an open source Bitcoin developer and educator. Hi, everyone. My name is Gustavo Flores. Uh, I work at Wasabi Wallet. I'm a content writer. Wasabi is a self-custody open source Bitcoin wallet that has a coin joint feature. So if you have a uh, Bitcoin that you want to reclaim your privacy on, you can use Wasabi. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, this panel uh, aims to uh, discuss the importance of self-custody and also privacy uh, and address some misconceptions and also some myths, right? So perhaps uh, just to gauge a little bit the audience, uh, yeah, maybe it's going to be tricky to answer this question, but uh, yeah, uh, for the reason that we might discuss here, anyways, uh, in a show of hands, uh, I would like to know uh, who here uh, does self-custody or is familiar with self-custody? Kind of half, huh? Good. Yeah, again, and also in a show of hands, so uh, who here has already used the, any uh, privacy-preserving tools while transacting Bitcoin? Yeah, a little bit lower. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so in the Bitcoin world, uh, there is a mantra coined by uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, which is uh, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Yeah, Jameson, can you explain this mantra and, uh, and by that define what is self-custody and why it is important? Sure. So uh, really what we're talking about is uh, ownership. And the thing is... Bitcoin is its own self-contained system. So normally when we talk about ownership in the world, what we're really talking about is legal ownership or, you know, uh, what does the ultimate authority in your local jurisdiction uh, consider to be, you know, the true owner of any given asset? And, and then, you know, how can you use various tools and uh, the legal system and justice system to have recourse in case your uh, claim to property ownership is somehow violated. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't care about any of that. You know, Bitcoin doesn't care about legal systems, uh, nation states, whatever. Uh, Bitcoin only cares about whether or not you can cryptographically prove to the network that you have the ability to spend uh, certain entries from the blockchain. So if you really want to say that you own Bitcoin, uh, my, <laughs> my claim is that uh, having ownership claims to Bitcoin at a third party, uh, whether that's you know, through an ETF or through an exchange, some other custodian, uh, while, while you can have legal claims to that Bitcoin, it's not gonna be very helpful to you if you end up in some sort of rug pull or bankruptcy situation or a million other things that can go wrong where you, you ask to you know, take ownership or you ask to be able to use those essentially IOUs, those claims to Bitcoin. And for some reason, for whatever reason, the counterparty uh, does not follow along with your request. So if you have your private keys to your Bitcoin, 
as long as you're following the rules of the Bitcoin protocol, you can uh, move that money around, spend it, uh, do whatever you want, as long as you're following the protocol and you don't have to ask permission from a third party. You don't have a counterparty that can refuse or you know, deny those claims. Yeah, great response. Is there anybody else wants to add something? You're good? Okay. So, um, if we, yeah, if we compare uh, holding gold, uh, gold, physical gold and uh, Bitcoin, one could naively say that, oh, it's much easier to uh, self custody Bitcoin because it's, uh, it's a digital asset, right? Um, but I guess the question is uh, for uh, our panelists. So what are the risks of uh, yeah, doing self custody of Bitcoin and any other digital asset? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So. Uh, any form of custody has some risks involved in it. So you, you have your self-custody, which comes with its set of risks. You have third-party custody, where you're trusting somebody entirely with your assets. That comes with its own set of risks. On the self-custody side, there's user error. There's the, you know, the chance that you could screw it up. It's a whole learning curve when you're dealing with something new like this, where cryptographic material has to be uh, created in the right way, maintained, stored, kept safe all with best practices, and if you lapse for a second, your assets are gone. So, you know, it's a very unforgiving form of um, custody where user error can, can be a big problem. It also comes with, you know, the wrench attack problem of, of you can keep your Bitcoin as safe as you can keep that cryptographic material. Um, those are some of the problems on the self-custody side. On the third-party custody side, of course, you have a totally different set of problems where you know, we've seen FTX or Mt. Gox or Prime Trust, Fortress Trust, Quadriga, any you know number of uh, failures of third-party custody uh, for various reasons over the last 15 years. Um, and you know, so that those are because of hacks or fraud or or misappropriation of funds. Um, that's counterparty risk. So you're either trusting yourself with self-custody or you're trusting a counterparty with third-party custody. Um, and, and those are the, the, the major two buckets. I, I would insert here that what we're working on at OnRamp um, and we're very excited about is with Bitcoin, it's possible to use its multi-sig uh, properties to have multi-institution custody where you're mitigating that counterparty risk, the third party counterparty risk by having a multi-sig quorum where different institutions each hold a key and do not have a quorum themselves, so they don't have unilateral control of the assets held in that um, vault. Uh, and in that way, you can mitigate counterparty risk while allowing the end user to retain control without having to hold keys. So um, various risk trade-offs with different forms of custody. Self-custody, I think, has some of the um, bigger hidden risks uh, of, of user error or, or inheritance error where you, you know, don't propagate successfully to the next generation. Third party custody comes with its risks. They all have some trade-offs. Well, so there's, well, there's a million different ways you can slice and dice this. Uh, and to make it as simple as possible, I'd say when it comes to uh, risks, it's basically we're always talking about risk of loss. And usually that's either risk of theft, like the private key material getting into the wrong person's hands, or just complete loss and the private key material being in no one's hands and therefore being frozen forever. Uh, everything else, pretty much every other type of attack and loss scenario falls into that. Um, but when people try to weigh or quantify the, the risks of self-custody versus third-party custody, it can get really overwhelming because there's so many different attack vectors but the simplest way that I can put it, as far as I can tell from doing this stuff for a decade, is that the entire uh, world of risk, of self-custody risk, is actually a subset of the entire realm of risk of third-party custody. Because if you think about it, third-party custody, they are basically doing self-custody. Like They are undertaking the same actions that you would be undertaking for yourself. But what you're doing when you put those keys, that money, into the hands of a third party is you're saying, okay, you're going to take care of all of those risks that normally I would be um, 
having to deal with, but now you're also introducing a bunch of risks that are internal to that organization that's handling the keys. And this is where uh, third-party custody becomes problematic because it's almost always a black box. You don't know what sorts of internal controls are going on there. But you know, getting into uh, what he was talking about with multi-institution custody um, and multi-sig in general, this is where it gets really complicated but also interesting because we can create new security models in which you could call them semi-custodial, you could call them non-custodial, but you can basically put your keys and your money into a setup now where no one really has full custody. You can even do it so that even you yourself don't have full custody. And uh, it's gonna be very interesting to see how this pans out on the regulatory front and what the regulators think of this type of thing. But for now, we're operating in a great gray area and uh, we don't have to consider ourselves like financial institutions. Yeah, and our position, and our position is that we're unhosted wallets. <laughs> um, it, yeah, and, and I should, I just wanna emphasize that that's one of the exciting things about Bitcoin right now is that it's never been possible to have multi-sig with any asset before. It's only possible with, with this asset, with this a digital asset. Um, and that is going to be part of the story of Bitcoin becoming the preferred store of value asset for the 21st century, because it has these inherent properties that are more attractive than storing gold in a vault and hoping the IOUs are good. Um, and because multi-sig makes it possible to risk mitigate in a way that has never been possible with custody before. Awesome. Yeah, Jesse, uh, your business is around dealing with this challenge with self custody and stuff, right? So, uh, can you share uh, a, uh, some circumstances or situations in which a custodian approach is uh, acceptable or applicable? Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. Um, so, obviously, right now the the ETFs have been the, the big story uh, this year in, in Bitcoin. Um, a tremendous new demand source um, for Bitcoin and and capital flowing into Bitcoin. Um, they've all they're all using a, a third party custodian of one kind or another. Coinbase mostly, a, a couple others as well. Um, and from a regulatory point of view, that's kind of a requirement um, at, at this point in time. There in in the custody space, there's qualified custodians which is uh, really just kind of a, a checklist of uh, whether or not a, a, a custody company is following certain procedures that the traditional finance landscape has deemed to be um, you know, best practices. Uh, and, and that is what makes a, a qualified custodian. And from a, a TradFi point of view, um, you, know, you need that stamp of approval. Um, and so, but I would beg the question of, are they qualified custodians because they're the best at, at custodying digital assets or because of a somewhat arbitrary you know, list of what TradFi thinks about how custody is best done? Um, and for that matter, you know, we have a, a few examples recently of qualified custodians um, in, in, that have dealt with digital assets and have screwed it up. Um, Prime Trust and Fortress Trust being recent examples of that. Um, and so there may be a mismatch, uh, that in my opinion, there, there, is, there are qualified custodians that are not qualified to be dealing with, uh, with Bitcoin and digital assets. There are also Bitcoin native custody companies like, like BitGo, which is a, a fantastic custodian um, that is a qualified custodian and, and deserves it, uh, in, in my opinion, because they know what they're doing, they're, dig they're digital natives. Um, so I think we're going to see uh, over the next decade um, the regulations with regard to what is a qualified custodian and what does that mean with custodying digital assets shifting. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that will probably be uh, in response to some sort of blow ups that may happen over the, the coming years as Wall Street moves into into Bitcoin, um, and some of them may make mistakes about who to trust as their custodian. Good. Yeah, switching gears a little bit, um, privacy in the financial domain sometimes is perceived as a, a legal behavior or something that is bad, right? With some people stating that, oh, I have nothing to hide. So I think this question goes to everybody here in the panel. 
So what's the importance of private and how can we debunk this, uh, this kind of statement? Well, uh, so uh, it's very important to note the difference between privacy and secrecy. And if you want to look more into this, you can read uh, the Cypherpunk Manifesto by Eric Hughes. In that paper, he defines privacy as something you don't want everyone to know and secrecy as something uh, that you don't want anyone to know. So privacy is the act to reveal oneself to the world in the way one chooses to. So for example, uh, it doesn't have to just be about what you, don't, you want the government to know or not. It can be what you want your employer or your friends or anybody involved in your life. Uh, and that is basically how to debunk the phrase, uh, I have nothing to hide. Well, we all have private matters because it depends with uh, from whom we're, we're choosing not to disclose that information to. Well, that um, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, but it's also you have to consider that whatever you put out into the world could potentially be used against you. You just don't know what someone's going to do with a particular piece of information. So while privacy is not a substitution for protection or defense, it's certainly relevant in the context of your own personal safety and security. Fair enough. And I mean, I think that it's clear that everyone has privacy, uh, e even if you don't want to admit it. I mean, everyone uses privacy technologies. And I'm not talking about you know crazy encryption protocols and stuff. Um, Everyone has blinds on the windows uh, to wherever they live. Uh, everyone uh, likes to have like doors on the stalls of the restrooms that they're using. You know, like these are very very basic things, but there's there are many aspects of our lives to which we have privacy components, and it's just it's really weird to me that a lot of people don't seem to see how that translates into cyberspace and our digital lives. Yeah. Yeah, uh, perhaps starting with Gustav, uh, what are the implications of uh, regulation in the privacy, uh, privacy landscape, right, in the cyberspace? Well, well, uh, there are many diverse implications, uh, and they depend on the nature and of the technology or the product. So, for example, it, on one end, you have custodial mixers, which are just custodial products where you can send your coins, uh, they, ha they are going to mix it and then they're going to send it back to you. Well, because of the custodial nature of that product, it is, uh, it, they have to implement KYC, know your customer and anti-money laundering policies. And if they don't, it's considered money laundering. And we've seen many cases in the US and in other countries where custodial mixers uh, get indicted uh, and get charged with money laundering. That's on one end. On the other end, you know, you have things just like coin control, which is the, you, the fact that you can decide which UTXO, which coin of Bitcoin, which piece of Bitcoin, uh, how you're gonna spend it. Uh, so you're just gonna, for example, label each different piece of Bitcoin you have, and you're gonna track that they don't, for example, mix between themselves. And that is just using Bitcoin by itself. That if you ban Bitcoin, you ban coin control, but there's no difference between coin control and Bitcoin. And you also have things like Monero, where uh, it's not regulated at the individual level, but it's regulated at the exchange level. So for example, nine days ago, uh, Kraken removed Monero from uh, their Belgium and Ireland websites because of upcoming European Union regulations. And then there is the, the, the toughest spot, I would say, which is uh, products like Wasabi or protocols like Tornado Cash, where you have uh, a centralized component of it, but it is non-custodial. So for example, in Tornado Cash uh, cases, uh, the two main developers got arrested about two years ago, and basically they are charged with knowingly having facilitated a sanction evaded by sanctioned entities. Uh, and in Wasabi's case, for example, Wasabi is a, is a coin joint coordinator that is non-custodial, and it's also built in a zero-knowledge manner, so Wasabi cannot collect information on you, but it is still a centralized coordinator, a server that belongs to an entity. And can that be regulated? Well, for ex I, I'm not part of the management team or the ownership team of Wasabi, but what they decided is to implement a blacklisting policy where sanctioned entities, well, at least coins that are suspected to be in relationship or 
in ownership of sanctioned entities are not allowed to be part of a Wasabi coin joint. This is based on public information because some of this uh, can be known just looking at the blockchain. And so this is a preemptive measure that the, the, the executive team and ownership team at Wasabi took. Uh, and it's, it's a tough, tough spot to be in, you know, because there's a lot of personal liability and potential risk involved uh, with, with operating and running these privacy protocols. My opinion on this is that it's better to have multiple options uh, than just to find yourself with, with none. So in, in short answer, there are many diverse uh, implications and there are different places you can be uh, on the regulatory front and it, it would be better to have more clarity because right now this is still a big gray area. Okay, cool. So yeah, perhaps this question would be more for lawyers, but uh, so is it illegal to use uh, pri privacy preserving uh, tools uh, in Bitcoin specifically? Yeah, well, just to continue on that, uh, well, it's, first of all, it's not illegal from a user point of view. If I'm using a coin join, I'm just being part of a collaborative transaction. So I'm just using Bitcoin. It can, uh, Bitcoin is illegal in some countries, very few of them. So in those countries, it would be illegal to use CoinJoin. As Tor, for example, is illegal in some countries and it would be illegal in those countries. But uh, in general, CoinJoin, PayJoin, these technologies are just doing regular Bitcoin transactions, so they're not illegal. Um, unfortunately. Unfortunately. If you are a person who uses cutting edge strong privacy protection technologies, you will be treated as a second class citizen. Uh, one example of that, uh, I use like VPNs and Tor 100% of the time. I'm really, really good at captchas now. Um, <laughs> and just, just an added bonus that I wasn't expecting. Um, well, that, that's at least for the sites that allow me to use a CAPTCHA. There's a lot of sites that simply won't load at all. They just completely uh, blacklist even trying to connect uh, from any sort of Tor or, or known VPN address. Uh, related to that, if you're doing uh, Bitcoin privacy, pay join you should be okay. Uh, but if you're doing any of the big coin join uh, pools out there and then you try to send those coins to a KYC regulated service, you're probably going to get your account shut down. Yeah, cool. So since we are talking about regulation, so is there any implication, uh, regulation implication on the self-custody part? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Privacy and security are closely intertwined, like Stacy was saying. I, I think there have been some movements in European legislation that basically are seeking for anyone who wants to have the security of self-custody to have to do a lot of additional reporting, uh, or at least when they're like withdrawing money from any regulated services. So essentially destroying any privacy they might have. I'm, I'm not sure what any additional ramifications they might have if they tried to do coin join stuff. Probably same thing as their uh, exchange might shut down their account. Um, you know, we've seen exchanges even shut down people's accounts simply because they were like several hops away on blockchain transactions. So it, it really starts to be a sort of uh, guilt by association thing. And of course, if anyone is familiar with the like seven degrees of Kevin Bacon uh, type of thing, it's like if you go more than three or four degrees away, you, you're going to capture like half of the world in whatever dragnet you're setting up. Yeah, um, Stacy, you you are a Bitcoin Core developer and also have broad experience in developing wallets and stuff, right? So, uh, uh, according to you, uh, from the perspective of a regular user, user uh, how hard is uh, to use Bitcoin uh, while preserving uh, privacy? Yeah, it, it's really hard to use Bitcoin in a way that's private if you are a regular person. And even if you're a really skilled person, it's also really hard. We're talking about really regulation. I think it's worth mentioning that the majority of people acquire their Bitcoin, at least right now, through exchanges. And here in the U.S., they are subject to KYC. That's Know Your Customer. It was introduced as part of the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970, and that means you need to provide your driver's license, your home address, your social security number, your phone number, and a selfie with all that um, just to be able to use that platform. And then 
we are talking about moving coins on and off that, so they know who you are. But even if you're going to withdraw to your own self-custody, they know where you're sending it. So pres they can make assumptions that like you probably own those addresses. So that's not great. Um, also, in terms of wallets, most many wallet providers, as a courtesy to their users, they allow you to use their Bitcoin nodes. Why do we need to use Bitcoin nodes? Well, in order to use the Bitcoin network, we need to broadcast transactions or we need to check our balance and you need access to a node for that. Well, guess what? If that's not your node, then whoever's node it is sees what you're doing. They see what transactions you're broadcasting. They see what addresses you're interested in and they can make assumptions like, oh, they, these addresses probably belong to the same wallet. Um, so it, it's hard and I was going to end this on a high note, but it's not. Uh, it, address re reuse used to be a thing. Like, it, you're not supposed to reuse addresses. It's just not good practice, and it's really low-hanging fruit. Like, it's very easy for wallet developers to just generate a new address. Um, and so the, I thought that problem had mostly gone away until I saw a tweet from Jameson in December that address reuse in 2023 has gone up from 48 to 70%. Uh, which is wild to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you want to give the reason? <laughs> well, some speculation and rumors that I heard were actually uh, that a lot of people came from the Ethereum ecosystem into some of the newer Bitcoin meta protocol stuff, and they were just so used to using the same address for everything that, yeah, yeah why not? Model. So, yeah. Well, lots of room to improve. Cool. So, uh, Stacy, uh, so which uh, new uh, Bitcoin developments and also new projects that you consider that, that are exciting and uh, you think that will have a positive impact either on privacy or self-custody? Yeah, uh, so one that I really would love to talk about and I'm glad it got a shout out uh, in the previous panel is PayJoin. And I think like right now we're seeing a lot of momentum around off-chain technologies which is great, but PayJoin is really cool because it gives you privacy pretty much instantly on chain at the time of payment. And it's almost free, the sender pays like a little bit uh, because the way it works is instead of a transaction having inputs only from the sender, the receiver contributes an input as well. So now you've broken that assumption that all those inputs belong to the sender. Now you don't know. And, and I'm, I presume you can add like more than one too. Um, so that, that seems really promising to me. We're actually at a point where PayJoin V2 is currently being worked on. I think it was last summer, there was a draft BIP that went out to the mailing list. And in December, it was given a BIP number, BIP 77, so that's really promising. Um, another technology is Chami and Mints. That's um, also really exciting, where basically you you take your asset to the mint, so in this case it would be Bitcoin, and the mint is able to do something called a blind signature where they sign it and create an IOU for it without ever knowing who it originated from. And, and you take that IOU and you pass it around, you trade it for goods and services and whatnot within the mint, and then when it's time to cash out, you, you, you trade it back for that Bitcoin. Um, so I think that like, there's some really good stuff being worked on, and I, I think there's a reason to be optimistic. Yeah, um, I would just note that, uh, Debbie Downer again, um, <laughs> uh, is that, uh, I think this is actually from the Cypherpunk Manifesto, but you know, privacy only extends so far as the cooperation that we have amongst each other in society. Uh, if I'm the only one who's doing privacy preserving stuff and nobody else is, you know, I have an anonymity set of one, which is no anonymity. Uh, so to put that in con context of like pay join, uh, pay join works when you have a counterparty that also follows the pay join protocol. So like it would be awesome if we got every wallet, every provider, every custodian in the Bitcoin ecosystem to support the pay join protocol. That would just like supercharge privacy 
across the entire network. And the great thing about PayJoin is that it can just be built into the software. Like people don't need to know that this is happening. The software just negotiates it automatically. But a similar type of thing, like if you're using Tor or VPN or whatever, it's, it's because such a small percentage of society is using some of these more cutting edge tools that it's a lot easier and, and convenient for uh, the rest of the internet infrastructure to just put up various walls and say, no, we don't want to serve you. Uh, it's, you know, it's not at the point where it becomes economically infeasible to reject uh, a large portion of your potential customer base. Yeah, and on the self-custody part and, and marrying that with what Jameson was just saying of um, regulation for self-custody, uh, it's free speech ultimately and it's property rights and you know there there could come a time when governments try to encroach on allowing that um gladly there happily there's some precedent from the 90s of cryptography being uh, having this battle um where it was deemed a weapon and then the uh, legal battle that ensued allowed cryptography to be securely uh, recognized as speech it's ultimately it's text and it's speech and it's not a weapon um and in this country we have you know our, our first amendment um and having 12 words in your head is speech um and so having a wallet where you're self-custing because you happen to have a, a special code that is fundamentally text it's just information that is speech and so we, we, we may have that uh, battle ahead of us a, a bit more, but I think we have precedent uh, and momentum on our side. So, you know, on, on, the, on the regulation front for self-custody, that should be a fight that, that we can win easily, but um, it, it, we may have to scrap a little bit more. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, I want to allow some time for uh, taking questions from the audience. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, I would like uh, uh, each of you some, uh, to share some passing thoughts and, uh, and most importantly, some tips for us regular plebs to enhance our practice uh, while, uh, while dealing with uh, privacy and self-custody. Not only on the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space, but also in the, yeah, when do we are uh, dealing with cyberspace in general? I mean, the, the lowest hanging fruit that every internet user should be doing is installing ad blockers. I mean, the, the you know, corporate surveillance regime that is just blasted all over the internet, you know, every website you're going to often getting tracked by dozens of different aggregators that are then packaging up and reselling your data. Um, I actually worked in that industry for a decade before, uh, completely flipping around, uh, learning about the cypherpunk movement, becoming a cypherpunk. Um, I was there, like I was on the back end sucking up your data and, and analyzing it and providing it to corporations to you know, try to target stuff to sell at you. So I'm, uh, I'm fully cognizant of just how much surveillance is actually going on. And it's, you know, it's not government surveillance, it's, it's, it's for-profit surveillance. But of course, then the government has found out that, hey, we don't need to worry about your constitutional rights. Uh, uh, you know, we don't actually have to infringe upon your rights because these corporations will just sell us your data now, and that's completely legal. Um, I will say, this one's not free, but if you're on the fence or I've been thinking about it, it makes sense to get a P.O. box. There are so many things out there that want your address that don't need it. Uh, and it's given me a lot of peace of mind having it. And, and you'll start to see opportunities to use it um, as, as it goes on. So that, that's my advice. The, the tip I would give on privacy is something that I see a lot of people doing. So for example, they coin join, but then they don't protect their network privacy. So they're not using Tor and they're you know put, putting their IP address out there or they're not running a node. So they're contacting another server to get their transaction data. Uh, so if you want to be private on Bitcoin, you not only have to protect your blockchain privacy with things like PayJoin and CoinJoin, but you also have to protect your network privacy with running a node and using Tor. Yeah, this is less on the privacy side, but more on the self-sovereign side. Take on self-custody. Um, Bitcoin allows that, uh, and, and that's particularly attractive with multi-sig, um, you know, whether that's through Casa or any other, other provider or, or through OnRamp. Um, with our multi-institution version of multi-sig. But um, 
you know, in the past, holding gold under your, your mattress, uh, you know, wasn't really a winning strategy. That's why banks came to be, you know, because you'd store your gold in their vault and they'd give you a, a promissory note. Um, and great, but Bitcoin makes it possible for you to take control of your assets with a level of security that's not possible with physical assets because of, because of multi-sig in particular. Um, and geographically distributed multi-sig makes it so that you can control your assets, and 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 that's just that just wasn't possible uh, in the past. And it's a big, I think it's a you know the, the number one thing you can do to become more self-sovereign. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, it looks like that I will add some some of them to my checklist. You know? Well, so let's take some questions from the audience. So, go for it. If I had to recommend to a family office or grandparents how to buy Bitcoin, I think I'd say buy an ETF as long as there's um, not a premium to that value and have the fidelity. Because if they lose it, their exposure is so big, they're going to make good to you, even if you screwed up. Or Morgan Stanley or you know, State Street. I mean, how would you recommend to someone who's not at MIT? It's a normal person. <laughs> Assuming we want to say you can pop up 1%, 2% of your money in Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. There's, there's a certain um, tech proficiency that, that comes with it. Basically, what you're what you're running there is a calculation about their risk of screwing it up versus Fidelity's risk of screwing it up, and, and you're deciding that you're going to point them towards Fidelity, um, and that's that's fair. However, um, as time goes by, these self custody solutions get better and better. They're, you know, we're we're in the early days of the internet in terms of usability, um, and they will continue to improve and get easier and Collectively, we will all learn um, about how to engage with, with these technologies, how to how to manage um, a Bitcoin wallet. Um, on top of that, there's you know <laughs> that's where multi-institution custody comes in. Of of you're you're assessing that Fidelity's risk of screwing it up is lower than uh, than an individual, um, but that is one of the frontiers where you may not need to trust Fidelity unilaterally. You can trust a quorum of institutions and okay. mitigate risk further. Their reputation is too important. And, and, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, as Bitcoin grows as an asset, though, um, you know, will they be able to uh, longer term? Fidelity is a very large, a very large uh, asset manager, so that will remain true for a very long time. Um, that may not be true for smaller Wall Street firms for yeah. as long. So. I mean, that's kind of um, that's the too big to fail mindset, uh, and we've had a number of people suffer catastrophic losses because they use that same mindset with other large Bitcoin providers. Now, Fidelity is a very different beast; it's just a different scale. Um, I will tell you from experience, we have plenty of boomers, and, you know, people in their 70s and 80s using Casa. And it's not just because we've made it simple, it's because we have a really hands-on support team. So um, you know, with CASA, you're, you're actually getting people who are able to help you get past any of the, the tricky technical hurdles there. So it's, it's definitely possible with hand-holding. Now here's one thing we haven't covered, which is there's some weird trade-offs and friction uh, between privacy and self-custody in the sense that if you want the ultimate level of privacy, the downside is you can't depend upon anyone. You have to do everything yourself. And this is probably your, the assumption you're making. If, if I'm doing my self-custody, I'm doing everything myself. Now, if you're able to trade off a little bit of that, so, uh, so CASA, for example, uh, we don't do KYC. We allow our clients to be pseudonymous. You don't have to tell us your name. We just need to have ways of authenticating you and communicating with you. But if you're willing to trade off that little bit of privacy in return, you know, we can give you a lot of help. We can get you unstuck. We can uh, you know, be one key holder for you in case you lose a key, something goes wrong. Uh, so it's all about trade-offs and um, it's, it's a complicated space, but I think I will say that I certainly don't believe that like a lot or the majority of people will do self-custody on their own without any help whatsoever. Yeah. 
bear with me here. I'm, I'm really new, but I'm curious. So I did transaction on Coinbase. So my question was, I think it was mentioned that when you lose it, you just it's just gone. And you mentioned also what is that they called a frozen bit, something like that. But anyway, what my, I'm interesting is what happened with that frozen bit behind the scenes and will that be valuable along the line? Let's say I imagine if a lot of people try to, to put money and then they lost it. So I just try to imagine, will that be somewhat valuable an, along the road? Let's say the company flourish and then become, what is that, acquired. So is that, is that what happened with that frozen bit? Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, a couple, couple different scenarios there. I think you're talking about like if you send a transaction to an address that nobody ends up controlling, right? Then it's frozen, it's stuck there forever. Lost it, yeah. uh, it's it's lost. It's a donation to the Bitcoin network. It's a donation to other Bitcoin holders. Uh, it's a to donation to society. Um, it, within Coinbase, like if you were to be sending that from a Coinbase account to another Coinbase account, uh, they would have the keys to all that so it wouldn't end up as a frozen transaction. They would have access to it at all times. But I think the frozen transaction thing was more of a on-chain transaction it, when a, an, a user ends up losing the keys to that particular address. Does that make sense? Or, yeah. yeah. So maybe let me repeat. So what happened with that lost transactions that the owners of that, let's say me losing that money, it's gone. So my, Im my impression that I will never get that back, right. correct? So what happened behind the scenes, that lost money of mine that I put it in, in the long run, will that be somehow valuable for that company? No, no, I mean, no one, not even the company has access to that. So it's estimated that like millions of Bitcoin are permanently lost and, uh, you should basically just make that mental calculation of, okay, so the actual usable supply of Bitcoin is never going to be 21 million. It's going to be well under that. Yeah, so just to clarify, and I think Jesse was getting to this, um, if the scenario you're talking about happens within Coinbase, yeah, I, they, they can recover it at some point because... They, they are custodying those coins. But if that scenario happens in a situation where you are self-custodying and holding the funds yourself, then yeah, totally lost. It. As Satoshi would say, it's a donation to us all. Thank you. So I guess we have time for one short question. No, so, so this is a common type of, of scam, really, where people will set up fake exchanges and allow you to deposit money. And in some cases, they'll even tweak your account to make it look like you've made a lot of money. And then if you try to go uh, withdraw, they'll probably ask you to like pay your taxes up front. You know, this is a sort of like affinity fraud scam. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately... The only way to protect yourself from that is to use like the big name exchanges, um, you know, and how do you know what those are? <laughs> well, uh, that's that's where having to do a lot of research, look around on different websites and see, you know, what are the biggest and most reputable places to do business. But, um, you know, probably the vast majority of places out there that claim to be exchanges or websites where you can buy and sell crypto assets, uh, probably completely fake and you'll never get your money back. But 
one easy way to try to test the waters if you're not sure is only put a little bit of money in and then immediately try to take it out and <laughs> like see like are they even letting you take anything out in the first place but even that's not a guarantee because they might just be trying to trap you to get you to make a really big deposit yeah yeah Oh, yeah, I'm regulated. Well, look, FTX was the most highly regulated company in the crypto ecosystem. So it's like, who do you trust, right? And this is why we're here telling people to take self-custody, because you can only really trust yourself. You, There might even be government authorities and regulators out there who have, like, rubber stamped. Yep, this is a real company. They exist. That doesn't mean that they're legitimate. Okay. I, unfortunately, I think that our time is all we have for this panel. Uh, so, yeah, fascinating discussion. So, thank you very much. So, yeah, uh, join me in for a round of applause to our speakers.